so happy to welcome Leslie to Chicago. She's one of my favorite writers. So, um, and thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, hi. Hey. I'm How are so you? I'm so happy to be here. We I was really excited when I found out that Megan was going to be talking to me today. Um, so we've just been walking you. around drinking coffee. Can you tell that? <laughs> we've been walking around <laughs> drinking coffee. So, so we're going to kind of now continue the conversation we've been having for two hours and you're just all gonna jump in and we'll kind of give you the context as we go. Um, but with the theme of the Humanities Festival being power, I was hoping that that could be a place where we would start. So um, what do you think of power in terms of writing and what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, so it's a huge and wonderful question. I guess um, one place to begin and certainly something I was thinking about in some of the pieces in this collection is the the ways in which power dynamics come into play when you're when an artist is using the material of other people's lives as the subject of her art or his art um and even the kind of verbs we use around that process like using or taking a photograph you know they they often get start to get at in their texture what can be troubling about that process. So there's um, there's one of the writers who's had the greatest influence on me, and I think about influence less in terms of like untroubled adoration and more in terms of like very troubled wrestling or something like that, is James Agee. And his 1936 work, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, about three, you know, which started as a book of, uh, as a, an article of magazine journalism for Fortune magazine in 1936 about three sharecropper families in Alabama and was killed by the magazine, um, perhaps because Fortune magazine wasn't interested in publishing the expose of poverty that AG ended up writing. But AG undeterred, turned it into this like 415 page crazy explosion of not only documentary writing about the lives of these families, but also a really tortured analysis of the ways that all of these inescapable power dynamics were at play embedded in the very act of him writing about these families. So he's a Harvard educated uh, New York Magazine writer who has an office in the Chrysler building in Manhattan um, coming and basically, you know, creating beautiful sentences for the wealthy readers of Fortune magazine that are taking as their subject the the brutality um, of capitalism as manifest in the lives of these sharecropper families. And so he's thinking about how, you know, he has so much power and he's also profiting off of their lives in that transaction. And I think one of the implicit questions that his work raises is like, does it solve that problem to confess it? Or does it solve that problem to be aware of it? And I mean, his answer is no, no problem is solved. There's just the articulation of guilt and then the problem remaining on the other side of that articulation of guilt. But I do think that that idea of uh, the sort of tension created where, you know, um, as somebody who's writing for any kind of audience whatsoever, you always have a certain kind of power. Um, and if you only write about the material of your own life or, or things that are close to you or things that share a world with you, you're using that, you're sort of limiting the orbit of that power or the reach of that power. But when you extend that power sort of far beyond yourself or far beyond your world, then you risk these dynamics of exploitation or you're telling stories um, that you haven't lived, which raises sort of trouble of its own. But, th but thinking through those questions of, power in terms of how it charges the relationship to other people's lives is kind of one of the abiding tensions I think I've been fascinated by. That, and that makes me think of, so we both teach creative nonfiction, which often means people come up to you at parties and they're like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> what is that form? And, and I often find myself answering it with something that you wrote in 2014 in Publishers Weekly about how when you were making essays, a thing that you were trying to do was to take memoir and reportage and investigative work and cultural criticism and kind of blend everything and blur it all and blur it all together and and I think that that's a when when I hear people talking about your work um, that's something that they often say is how you're redefining the form so I'm wondering about power and so far as form um, so many of the essayists that we have read over the years are dudes and uh, um, and and to see some of the work that you're doing to um, 
to challenge the form that, that they're doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I love that question, what's the relationship between, between power and form? And I think to start with AG, although I won't end with him, and he is, he is one of the dudes, right? <laughs> Maybe the, one of the original dudes. Um, I, I think part of, for him, part of what it meant to break the standard form of, of magazine journalism and sort of bring his, like, tortured eye into the frame was to use, in that case, the hybridity of, like, bringing a much more personal, subjective narrative into the, like, strict confines of magazine journalism was to, like, make explicit certain questions about power that he felt like couldn't live inside a more standard genre form of just, like, reportage as it had been practiced. Um, and I think for me, often the, the reason that I'm drawn to bringing together these multiple modes personal narrative, cultural criticism, literary criticism, reportage, is, is, is because there are questions that, f that it, it feels exciting to get at those questions from as many angles as possible. And when I move through the world, I'm not moving through the world with all of those parts of myself, the reader, the mother, the lover, the journalist. Like, th they, don't, they don't exist in, like, neatly portioned you know, sections of the toddler plate or whatever, like they're all speaking to each other in my mind, so why not let them speak to each other on the page? But I think one of the things that can come from working in those hybrid forms is a sense of freedom about questioning or somehow illuminating the terms or the context of the writing as you're doing it. So like, uh, as an example, like one of the pieces in this book is about traveling to Sri Lanka for a travel magazine and the premise of the assignment was that this travel magazine would only tell you 24 hours in advance of the trip where you were going. So you sort of block off a week of your life, they buy you a ticket somewhere, but they don't tell you where that somewhere is, and then 24 hours before your plane takes off, they tell you where you're going. And so it's preparation or research then is nil. Before yeah, you. research okay. is re yeah, research is contained to 24 hours yeah. <laughs> as which also hold packing and you know, um, but the I think the, yeah, and for many parts of my sort of like hyper-organized type A personality, there was like some anxiety embedded. But I was also, you know, at a certain point in the, in the piece itself, I really think about, or I'm, I'm trying to question, how is the very premise of that assignment sort of insisting upon a kind of ignorance that often accompanies travel anyway, which is to say you sort of show up somewhere because you have the resources to show up in that place, but you might not actually know the first thing about it and what kind of sight does that unknowing or that kind of spontaneity that we sometimes find easy to fetishize like what what kind of unknowing gets sort of exalted in that context but all that to say that the in that case the sort of form the playing with form takes t manifests in writing like a, a magazine piece of travel writing, but also letting this other version of the eye into the frame, that eye that's saying, well, what's actually happening here in my being funded to write this piece? And what does that mean? And what, wh how, how is there a sort of ignorance that's being given a kind of seal, seal of approval in the very context of the premise itself? There was a, um, another festival guest. Um, her name is Sarah Smarsh. Have you read any of her? Have, have you all read Sarah Smarsh? For the people taking notes, jot, jot her name down. You teach see the teacher. But anyway, I, when I heard her speak, so she, she, she's a journalist, but she talks about uh, she's, um, she comes from the South, grew up in poverty, and she started realizing when she was sitting in these newsrooms that a part of her power in the writing was that she ha actually had the lived experience um, <coughs> of growing up that way. And so, so primarily she writes about class, right? Because so many of the people who are writing about class never had that lived experience. And it was sort of that realization that made her kind of decide that she wanted to start using the the eye, the, the personal narrative in, in her journalistic work because of the power that came from that. And, and so I'm thinking about that in terms of like you writing about sobriety having gone through recovery and you writing about birth having gone through that experience. And, and so just the, the power that comes from including the lived experience in the reportage. Yeah, well, and I think that there can be a... Um implicit or sometimes explicit hierarchy of rigor drawn like a, a sort of totem pole of nonfiction forms where you know investigative reportage is the most rigorous or like war 
war war reporting is like the most rigorous of the rigorous, you know, and and that you sort of you descend into less and less rigor as you get into like you know cultural criticism or arts criticism or literary criticism and like the sort of personal essay. You're going to tell us how you feel about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I mean, this is. I. I mean, I. I just can't even tell you the number of writers, especially female writers, I've spoken to who feel that they internalized at some point along the way the idea that personal writing was less rigorous than these other forms of, of, mm -hmm. of outward looking prose. And I think for me, part of what's exciting about sort of blending all these modes together is, you know, um, that I don't <laughs> that I don't believe in that hierarchy of rigor, and that I think that there's, you know, I feel as a reader so grateful for personal narratives that I've known, and I think, you know, straight personal narrative can be just as rigorous insofar as it does all that kind of intellectual work of asking these deeply important questions about what does it mean, what does it feel like to be alive, what is consciousness like, what is consciousness like in relation to other people's consciousnesses, what are relationships composed of, uh, how is one, you know, uh, both a private citizen and like a member of a, a thousand larger communities and what are those overlapping spheres saying to each other and all, I mean all of the essential questions that I turn to literature for can be spoken to in these really powerful ways through personal narrative, and I believe that deeply. But I also think that there's something about blending the modes that is itself challenging that hierarchy, right? To say that, like, the reporter who's doing this work that has long been acknowledged as rigorous is also somebody who believes that this personal experience is an important part of the story. I think that seeing those two modes of inquiry in the same frame is also doing a kind of challenging of that hierarchy that has often also really become a kind of gendered hierarchy too. I think about it too sometimes in, in like kind of through the lens of credibility, like like who is allowed to talk about what and and sometimes the answer of that the answer to that comes from well I have done this all of this research and all of this study and all of this scholarship for years. So so that gives me the authority to talk about it. And but then I think about it for, from another way there's a um, Chicago writer who I love so much. Her name is Deb Lewis. And years ago at Martyrs, I curated this show, and the, the, the theme was writing from the edge. And Deb writes a lot about BDSM. So I called her up, and I was like, Deb, dude, you have to come in and, and do the BDSM stuff. And she was like, well, I'll do it, but, um, but that's not writing from my edge. That's like Tuesday. So, um, <coughs> so if you want me to come in and do this, like you, you need to let me write from my edge. And, and I mean, God, what a, what a challenge there, right? So she came in, she did a story about uh, being an incest survivor, and, and that's one of those subjects that, that right away we're like, I, I, don't want, I don't want to talk about that, it's too, it's too much, it's too heavy, and, and because of that, we're not talking about a lot of things in this country that we need to be talking about, right? Like whether we're talking about incest, we're talking about sexual assault, we're talking about political conversations, we're talking about racism, like so, so many of these uncomfortable things that, that we need to, to dig into. Anyway, De Deb gets up on stage, she does this story, um, and she does it live, and then afterwards she is mobbed by audience members, so many of whom said that they had gone through that same experience. And, and it was, I mean, for me, like just the, the, the power and the fact that she had walked what they had walked. Um, and I think about that so much when I read um, uh, any of your work, like w whether you're writing about sobriety or whether you're, you're writing about motherhood or... Um, yeah, I mean, when well, that's a it's a power. I love so many things about that story, including the n the really fascinating and necessary truth that like everybody's edge is different. Like thinking about that from a lived perspective and a creative perspective, that like what is difficult for people to speak about varies so much from person to person, and that it's there's a certain kind of violence in assuming you know um, what make someone stutter or what becomes hard to speak, right? And so that idea that everybody's edge is different, I think is a really powerful one. Um, but certainly that sort of visual image of, of you know, being, um, facing the sort of swell of people who feel spoken to by a personal narrative. I mean, it's something I experienced as a reader, that sense of like deep resonance long before I ever published anything probably long before I ever wrote anything, but it's, it's certainly something that I, it's like the most meaningful 
part of doing anything public as a writer to me because it's like like so many writers I think I became a writer because I like was shy and didn't like talking to other people and my worst nightmare was like being on a stage with a light shining on me you know it's like these were the reasons it's not it's no longer this is not my worst nightmare talking to me you're doing great it. <laughs> <laughs> but um I think that sense of like when I when it first started to become a part of my life as a writer that there were that there was going to be this more public part of it really the the thing that feels meaningful at the core of that is getting to meet people who for whom like my work has landed in their lives in ways that I never could have predicted because it's not like it's not always that one to one correspondence of like oh you also you know, um, went through a particular kind of street violence or something, as did I. It's more often these surprising, you know, I remember getting a letter very early on when my, uh, soon after my last essay collection, The Empathy Exams, was published in 2014. One of the first uh, pieces of mail I got from a reader, like an email, was from an elderly man, like an 85-year-old man who was living in a retirement community and... He said that um, the the work had really challenged him to think about his own relationship to pain in these ways that he never had before. And that idea that, you know, A, it wasn't like speaking to somebody who had lived exactly the same experiences that I had. It was a different kind of resonance than that. And it wasn't necessarily somebody who felt like he, you know, sometimes we can talk about resonance with literature like, oh, I, f I, I felt that, that I, that narrator on the page was me, or that I, they were articulating something I had felt in clearer language than I'd been able to articulate it to myself. But for him, it was more like a, a provocation or an alternative to something he had felt. There was a different sort of energy happening between him and the work, and that was really interesting to me. But um, when you were speaking, I kept thinking about this phrase, witness authority, that I heard from a, when I was doing a lot of interviews with clinicians for my last book, The Recovering, about addiction and recovery, um, you know, I was talking to clinicians about their take on fellowship-based recovery, which is not a medical treatment, and so I was curious what doctors made of it, and they had this clinical language, it was fascinating to me, they had this clinical language for all of these things that I had lived through and felt really kind of saved by and fellowship-based recovery, but they had their own terms for it. And witness authority was this really beautiful one, which was just, it's different from the authority of a, a doctor or a medical professional. It's just the authority of somebody who's who's lived their own version of that experience. You, you talk a lot in the book about, the, it's the, the Sontag line, I think, the, the weight of witnessing as well, too. And so y you talking about that made me think of my, my friend Gita is a physician, and, and she and I talk sometimes about the... Um, the, the weight of carrying other people's stories, right, which I'm sure is, is part of recovery like that, that you're talking about, but I, I know is also a part of your being a personal, personal essayist and because when you put your stories out into the world, then people often want to share. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a, a recent essay that you had in the, the Sewanee Review about um, like being at the book signing table, like you're just about to, to be right now, but your daughter was just born, and she was at the other side of town, and like your whole body needed to get mm -hmm. back to the baby, but but you needed to stay here and, and listen to other people's stories, and how even, like, that there is a, a weight in, because um, there, there's something, too, about putting a personal story into the world, and how the, the, the reader or the audience then wants to share theirs with you in a different way than, than reportage. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, it, so many things to say. I mean, I, I certainly, sometimes when people talk about um, personal narrative as, uh, you know, in disparaging terms, I feel like some of the things that are said about it are like that it's narcissistic or solipsistic or something. But I, I often feel like the sort of activity that it sets in motion is, is runs really counter to those sort of forces of like um, narrowing the world because so often, yeah, putting your story out there, it just makes people want to share their own. I mean, there's really this sense of like, I've never been so aware of the stories of others as when I've put out a deeply personal story. And I think, you know, you can track that happening even inside of interpersonal conversations, the way that when somebody shares something difficult, one often really useful and certainly valid and, and supportive way of responding is to like, 
dig deeper into that experience, to ask them questions about it, to echo back the feelings that they've shared about it. But there's another way that's often more maybe what somebody needs, which is sharing some some experience from your own, not necessarily in a conflating way of like, I've lived exactly the same thing. And sometimes it can feel like one upsmanship, like, well, you thought that was bad. Like, oh, I've lived this worse thing, right. you know, which like rarely. The pain <laughs> Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. The pain Olympics. But I do think there's a version of it that's like, that, that can actually be genuinely consoling. And I think, I, so I think what, what we see at a book signing table is sort of a version of that process that often happens in personal conversations writ large, which is like, I went through this thing and it can feel good that somebody else also went through, um, you know, a humiliating breakup where they left like the drunk message <laughs> like for 10 days in a row on somebody's, you know, it's nice to know you're not the only person Get out of my in journal. history of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I wonder, um, there, there, there's an essay in the in the collection about um, you. You went to Croatia and you visited a museum of broken hearts where people submitted people like submitted objects that that that, illis that 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 made them think about like incredibly painful situations that they've been through. And one that really struck me that that you talked about was a woman had sent her journal to the this museum. She she'd been in a relationship with someone who had bipolar disorder and so like during an episode that that her lover would have she, she would just write over and over again uh, like uh, I'm just going to be present in the moment I'm just going to be present in the moment and and kind of the, this realization that you had about how um, sometimes writing is just the th it, her writing that is the thing that helped her get through and so I'm wondering about writing insofar as survival I mean it it was for her and she's not doesn't make her living as a writer, but I'm I'm wondering what that means for you. Yeah, well, I'm really glad I was. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the the museum um, in Croatia. It's yeah, it's called the Museum of Broken Relationships. Probably some people here have, have heard about it or maybe even been there. But um, because when we were talking about writing and power earlier, I think one of the things that's really powerful to me about that museum is the idea that like anybody can be a writer in the context of that museum. Like anybody can be an exhibit in that museum. Each object that's donated to the museum is donated by just a regular person and it comes attached to a sort of curatorial narrative. So the toaster has a narrative about the relationship that the toaster was used inside of. The ax has a narrative about the man who axed his ex's furniture after she left, the, you know, handmade modem, the, the mixtape from Sarajevo, like they all have stories and the authors of those stories aren't professional authors. Their, their authority is the witness authority of somebody who's been in a relationship that ended, that they had trouble letting go of, um, which is like a, you know, I don't want to say it's a universal experience, but it's a pretty common experience. And so there was something kind of democratic about the whole vibe of like who has the power to speak and whose life belongs in a museum and whose life is worth looking at and thinking about that I kind of liked about the whole structure of the thing. Um, and certainly I, I think that's really connected to the idea of writing of survival because it's like, I don't know, I think there, there can be an idea that you're... Um, story needs to be somehow exceptional or remarkable in order to be worth telling or in order to, to merit telling. Um, but I just don't, I, I just have never believed that. I think that every, I think every life has like a kind of an infinitude inside of it and that every life, if asked like provocative, difficult, illuminating questions has like many, many layers of truth inside of it. And so I think in that vein, there can be many ways of like writing, writing about your own life, writing about the lives of others that like can be important tools of like, you know, self-discovery and sense making or even when you're not totally making sense of something like living with its nonsense in a different way. Like that, I think those can be important ways of being alive even if you never publish a word of it. Do you, do you step into the writing process of this work knowing that you're going to include your own narrative? Like, I'm, again, I'm, I'm thinking of the Museum of Broken Hearts piece, which eventually becomes you th thinking through your past relationships that, that and, or I'm, I'm thinking there, the, the piece about Second Life, um, which ended up kind of being about your own impulses for escapism as, as well, too. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that you, that you, you begin knowing or if that's something that comes out in the um, process? So, uh, 
Sometimes, but usually, I mean, usually I end up feeling surprised by either the fact of personal narrative coming in or certainly the particular ways in which it comes in. So with the, the essay called The Museum of Broken Hearts about the Museum of Broken Relationships, um, I had a sense from pretty early on that I, I wanted personal narrative to play some role, almost because it felt coy not to, or it's just the version of the piece that I was most interested in writing was one where I, where I was like, look, like this is the baggage that I'm bringing to this museum. This is why I'm interested in the question of how we hold the residue of broken relationships inside of us. And for me, that residue was like, had a lot of kind of striated layers to it. So it was partially about the way I held you know, broken relationships inside of me, but it was also about the ways in which I held my parents' divorce inside of me and the ways in which I held the, like, many divorces that populated my family inside of me. And, and so it was, it was like, I think I, I'm often most drawn to bringing personal narrative into the frame of an essay when I feel like it can, it can create that experience for a reader of, like, deepening the question somehow, or sometimes I think about the, the physical image of standing in a room and there can be a move that an essay takes where you realize the floor that you were standing on kind of drops away and you're like on a, you're, you're, now you're in the basement or like now you're on a deeper floor than you knew you were standing on. And I think sometimes pivoting from the role of like a, you know, a, a critic who's moving through the hallways of this museum, sort of having observations about what she's seeing to saying, yes, as I was wandering through that museum, I was also thinking about the bag of, pistachio nuts that was like full of moth eggs in a in a house that I used to live in 10 years ago and like how when I think about that bag of pistachios I think about this man who I wanted to build a life with and that didn't happen you know and I think there can be a there's a crystal Pepsi yeah. bottle there is right? a bottle is that Christy still Pepsi? on your shelf it is well it's actually it's interesting life surprises us the, cr the bottle of crystal Pepsi which was given to me by a, a lawyer in Queens who is was once in my life and no longer is um was used to be on my bookshelf but it doesn't live there anymore only because my daughter at one point knocked it off of my bookshelf at which point I realized I needed to move it to a drawer so it still lives in my home but um its location in my home I guess is a testimony to the ways that life has unfolded since the since the lawyer was left the frame. After I read that essay, which is like so object focused, you know, kind of in a similar way to, have you all read The, the Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, right? But um, like I, I just started looking around my house and then objects started talking to me a, l a little bit. Like, I, I don't know if that's random, but it's like, what what is the story behind that yeah. coffee cup right there? I'm going to write you 7,000 words about yeah. what that means yeah. in the story. Or look at look at that shoe. What does the shoe mean? And I'll tell you, it, it was kind of a, a nice break from looking at Twitter and wanting to launch myself <laughs> into the sea. <laughs> did you have do you, did you have any objects that you you were thinking you would donate to the Museum of Broken Relationships if you ever found yourself in Croatia? Oh, that's really good. My my friend Sarah is in the front row right now, and I just heard her go, "Oh shit!" Oh, I heard yeah, <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. Do, well, I uh, are are your exes on Instagram? I don't know. Probably some of them are. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Well, that's a that that's a that was a recent discovery that I made. But that uh, but that's 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 not the that's not the the question ex exactly. You know the um you know the the shoe boxes that do, do you all have the shoe boxes under your bed? Like I, I I think about this sometimes. I I know that you're doing a lot of work in teaching around archives right now, right? And so um, and I I have the shoe box that's underneath my bed of the photographs and the receipts and the letters that they sent and the the tokens from the arcade that that we went to and I I wonder you know I'm I'm in my early 40s and and I wonder if that's changing now because so much of of that um, of the, the the documentation that we have of our relationships is is based online or it's digitized or um, so um, so yeah I still have boxes of of stuff that they touched or that they gave me or or that I you know that over the years I've thought you know and again I live in a apartment in Chicago it's not like I have a ton of space you know so you always wonder god should I should I toss this um yeah well and I think I I, I feel like our particular um 
I'm in my mid-30s, but I think in this way we are part of the same moment, which is to say that our lives are being archived kind of digitally and physically. At one, like I feel like we're in this in-between where, for me, the detritus of old relationships is it is in shoe boxes and folders, and I totally am a sentimentalist who is constantly being thwarted by my New York like stamp sized apartments where the part of me that wants to hoard everything because I want to hold all of it inside of me is also has like limited closet space you know but um but I also feel my gmail account as a, as a real set yes. of archives yes. and and certainly and you know text I, messages yeah totally and like the the you know the ways in which like with the recovering for example you know, which is a book that has personal narrative, literary criticism, a lot of archival research, a lot of reporting. Um, the I, I was aware that I was doing this archival research in order to write about the lives of other writers, like spending time with Berryman's archives and Dennis Johnson's archives and David Foster Wallace's archives and Jean Reese's archives. and But that I was also... There was a, a corollary to that in the personal narrative, which was there were certain parts of, say, of the demise of a relationship that I was trying to write about where I realized everything in my description of that demise was, like, very abstract. And so I literally went back into my all of my Gmail for a particular fall and was just like, let me just see what was in the swirl of my life in this moment. And it did feel like this kind of arc personal archival research where, you know, one of the things that I found was um, a, a CSA that we had signed up for where I could remember when I saw, you know, just the silly little like weekly recipes for like chocolate zucchini bread or whatever. I those recipes summoned this emotional state that I had been in where I was like, if I can just maybe make inventive dishes with fresh produce like this relationship is going to make it you know these ways that we <laughs> trick ourselves into believing that something can survive and the ways we like invest our tender little fragile hopes on like these like you know kind of um absurd like rocket ships of possibility you know where we're like if we can just do if we can just follow these recipes maybe it'll work but I, I had totally forgotten about that CSA and it was it was it was one of those cool experiences of being kind of surprised by your own life and and di the digital archives and the ways that they held this shit that I had totally forgotten about was really helpful in terms of like accessing that deep vein of feeling through this yeah like um the digital equivalent of like a little receipt that had just been stuck in the back of a book. Mm -hmm. Yep, I I go I'll go back like if I'm writing about a certain time period I'll go back. I mean at, at least if it's more recent I'll I'll go back through my Twitter feed mm -hmm. and I'll try to find like okay wait what what was I reading what was I into what was going on in the world that I was trying to to pay attention to or even sometimes just like like um like pump you know p popping. Uh, a, a certain year into Google, it's like, like I was I was writing about 1999, not too long ago, in a particular month, and I I was I was interested in like well what was the weather then, and you know just trying to 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 get the the details. Ooh, that reminds me of something else I want to ask you. But anyway, I I remember that uh, w w when I put it into Google and I asked what had happened in 1999, the same month I was writing about is the month that The Matrix came out in the theater in 1999. I saw that movie 12 times in the theater, <laughs> so I can't. Like it for me to be true, you know, and this gets to, to truth in, in essays, like for me to be true to that girl in 1999, I have to include that movie, which which makes me want to ask you. Oh, Wait, you go first. Well, yeah. well, I was I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave so quickly the fact that you went to the Matrix 12 times when it was in the theaters. Um, well, how did that end up? How did the how did the Matrix end up? speaking to the subject of the essay or like how did that thing that surprised you when you found it end up becoming part of the piece that you were making well i i think at, at the at the time there were some f f first of all i was i was in graduate school i was so i was teaching during the day and then i was going to class in the afternoon and then i was bartending at night and there was a lot of drinking and not a lot of sleep and so that so that um there's some questions of reality there then and, and of course the, 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 this is before cell phones but I, I just remember because I, I remember it was before cell phones because we still had um, phone booths on the street right remember those <laughs> children but I remember like walking down the street and walking past one and then just stopping and being like that's gonna ring <laughs> that and waiting and and in my memory I waited hours I'm sure I did not wait hours but like I, I can, 
I can still see that happening in, in my in my memory. So so I, I do I do think it had a lot to do with 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 what was reality in, in that moment. Um, but but what I wanted to ask is so I follow you on Twitter, and last year, uh, uh, kind of through my feed came up a big photo of a cake, and it said written in frosting on it. It said get specific. And so really what we're talking about with archives here is specificity. So I'm hoping you can tell them all about the cake, especially because I'm, I'm sure there's some writers right now making, w making work and this might be of use. Uh, so the cake was a cake that I, I wanna say, I made it for my students. I, I bought it for my students, but I did have this mm -hmm. special message uh, put on top. Um, and it was a little bit of a joke at my own expense because, so I teach in the, uh, graduate nonfiction MFA program at Columbia, and my workshop students hear me, are subjected to me saying the kind of the same things over and over again. But the thing that they hear me say the most is get specific. Um, and I wanted to <laughs> acknowledge how many times, and I'll say a little bit more about when and how I say it and what I mean by it, but I mean, it's sort of self-explanatory, but I, there's more to say about it. Um, but one of the things that came up when I, you know, when I brought this cake out and I said, look, I know I'm always harping on this, so, you know, I'm here's, I'm just going to say it one last time on this fucking chocolate cake and then we can be done. Um, but it, one, my, one of my students revealed that he was like, yeah, you do have some, some, some words you, you like to say quite a bit. And he revealed that my students actually had a drinking game that they played sometimes where every time somebody said a Leslie word, they had to take a drink. So words such as electricity, heat, consciousness. Um, I think what was another one? Oh, granular. I don't know when anybody would be saying that at like a, you know, at like midnight in Harlem, you know, but anyway granular, like these Leslieisms, um, which I hunger. kind of... What? Hunger. Hunger, yeah, yeah, I do say hunger a lot. Um, we had to say it here. Um, and so, I and I loved, I mean, I, I felt it was said with tenderness, but it's totally true that there are certain... I mean, I think we all have words that we orbit around and often land on. Um, you know, for me, having not taken a drink at that point in like eight years, I love that people were <laughs> drinking based off of my <laughs> vocabulary ticks as well, but... Um, yeah, I think for me, the idea of specificity, you know, is partially just, um, I, honestly, I think it comes from my background as a fiction writer. I, I wrote fiction before I wrote nonfiction. Um, my MFA is in fiction. My first book was a novel. And I think I really, some of why I fell in love with writing as a reader and a writer is just that, um, the modes of seduction and enchantment and world building and that sense of like building these lush, immersive environments on the page that are like populated by ex kind of like really, really exquisite sensory detail. And I don't even mean like pleasurable sensory detail all the time. Like I'm, I'm sure many people in this room watched Chernobyl, the um, limited series. Like I was so struck by Chernobyl's sensory environment is sort of the least appealing thing you could imagine. It's like Soviet era Russia. <laughs> plus nuclear meltdown, you know, but I was so struck by the sensory attention of that program and the ways that, say, you could hear the crackle of every cigarette but getting put out in an ashtray, and there was something about that exquisite attention that just made you aware of, like, in these lives, like, largely devoid of pleasure, like, you find your little pleasures where you can, and sometimes that little pleasure is a cigarette, but... I, it's is an example to show that like I don't just mean like pleasant sensory stuff. I just mean that like really close attention to the sensory dynamics of being alive. And I've just always felt that that very close attention to the specifics of experience, that the sensory specifics also takes you into a more nuanced, granular account of the kind of emotional dimensions of experience as well. That like when you're tracking the body, it takes you into these questions of like, how can I be even more specific in my summoning of that feeling? How can I get beyond that general word happiness and try to really summon this per what this particular moment of happiness felt like? So it, it's really about kind of candor and illumination and getting to that particular truth that only you're capable of bringing to the page. To kind of to bring it back to the the new book before we we open it up for for questions here, just 
thinking about how those sensory details will land us in a place or an experience, but in the writing of creative nonfiction, right, like our, our lives run parallel to our pages. And I know that there's a lot of pieces in this book that you'd started writing years ago, and you completely changed and your life completely changed during the writing of, of these. Like I, I, th th there's a, a line you have in an essay about the, the reckoning where you, you began the writing of the book as one person and you ended the writing of the book at, as another person. Or, or I'm thinking about like how, a, how an essay about your grandfather's death changes after the birth of your daughter and, and how living through the writing of these um, changes the, the piece. So I'm wondering if, if you can speak to that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was really, really exciting about putting this book together was, I mean, there are many essays in here that were written for this book, but other essays that I wrote many years ago that I came back to and revised so substantively that it almost felt like rebuilding a house with some of the planks of wood that I had used in the original destroyed building. But one of those that really speaks to exactly this dynamic you're talking about, about how we keep living and we keep changing as people, and that changes the way we might approach the questions at the heart of a piece of writing. There's an essay in here called The Long Trick that's about, uh, that used to be called Subdages, actually. And um, it's about the men in my family and certain dynamics of elusiveness and flight and distance that sort of uh, define a lot of the men in my family and the ways in which they relate to domesticity. And um, originally, I, you know, it's, it starts with my grandfather's death and thinks about his impact on my father and my father's impact on my brother. Uh, it sort of violates that, like, cardinal rule of grad school writing, which is, like, never start an essay with your grandparents' death. But I was like, I'm going to start this essay with my grandparents' death. Um, he was, a, you know, a drunk and an Air Force pilot and always going somewhere. And I he spent a lot of his life sort of developing properties in rural Brazil that became a sort of respite where he would, he would move his various families in the States to be in this other realm. And so I used the word saudades in the original version of this essay, which I wrote in maybe 2013, as a way of thinking about, um, you know, it, it's a, you know, infamously untranslatable word that gets translated as into English as things like, you know, maybe nostalgia for a place you never really lived or nostalgia for a love you never really knew. And I'm thinking, I was using it to think through the ways my, my grandfather was always an unknown to me, but I felt this kind of longing to know him anyway. And when I came back to the essay years later, after like five more years of living, I realized that I had a very different relationship to these like dynamics of like these distant, elusive men and my family. Um, and I had a much more interrogative relationship to like, why was I, the question wasn't just like, why are these men so elusive? But like, why was I drawn to that dynamic of perpetually chasing after elusive men? And I ended up discovering another definition of saudages that I hadn't discovered the first time around, which was not just a longing for some lost object or a longing for some object that you never knew, but a longing for the state of longing itself. And that like third definition of saudage is sort of broke the essay open for me and also allowed me to pinpoint what had changed in me along the way, which was that that I had more awareness of the ways in which I was like very comfortable in that state of longing and actually kind of more comfortable in the states of longing and yearning maybe than states of proximity or intimacy and that it wasn't just that I was like sort of had been damaged by these elusive men, but that I, I really loved something, there was something quite comfortable to me about that state of distance. Um, and that also, you know, these men that I had pegged as elusive men, like m maybe they were longing for things as well. You know, they weren't just objects of longing. They, they, uh, they longed also to like collapse certain distances or bridge certain distances. But that idea of like, my father wanting an intimacy he couldn't quite have wasn't something I, I had been able to see like six years earlier, um, but it was more available to me when I came back to that piece um, after, yeah, I think among other things, after becoming a, a, a parent and sort of feeling that way that you long for this little being and can't ever fully 
know that you'll never be able to fully kind of possess them. Thank you. We're gonna um, we're gonna open it up to some questions from the room. I've got Eric and Allison running around with wireless mics. So if you'd like to ask something of Leslie, I am gonna um, with with much love. I'm gonna say let's let's have questions. And if you have comments, you're welcome to say so to to Leslie when she sends your book later. But um, form of the question, Vanna White. Maybe that's the wrong. Is that the wrong one, Sarah? Okay. All right. Sarah sits in the front row and tells me what I'm doing wrong. Okay. What do we got, Chicago? Okay, Alec, um, grab the mic from. Um, Hi, I have a question about what it means to be an artist and what it means to create. Like I talk to people about being artists and they say, I just need to create. Um, I recently heard a musician and songwriter talk about how he always felt like what he had to say was important. Like he was raised like that, to believe that to be a true. Um, you talked about starting your career in fiction and I wondered if part of that was that you weren't sure that what you had to say about you was maybe enough or as important, or what maybe happened at that point to make you change to be the writer you are now. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I personally find it kind of p paralyzing to try to think about writing in terms of believing that what I have to say is important. I mean, in some way, of course, I must believe that, or else how could I write? But that particular language feels sort of terrifying to me because I, because I don't think that my life is extraordinary or unusual. or it's not, it's not that there's something about what I've experienced that makes it any more important or worth telling than what somebody else has experienced. I, I once had a, uh, was having a meeting with a student in my office and she said, she was articulating this kind of anxiety of like, why why does my story matter? And she, and she looked out the window at the kind of the lawn outside uh, the building we were in and she said, you know, why does my story matter more than his or hers and was pointing to particular people and I was like, it doesn't, like, and neither does mine, but it doesn't have to, like, um, he <laughs> should write his story too, and she can write hers, and, you know, that, that sort of sense of, um, it's, it's felt less like I need to give myself permission by feeling like there's something particularly important about my story, and more like, this is the story that I have the most access to. I think that's really what it feels like to me, which is not even to suggest that we have, that anyone has kind of like unmitigated or total access to their own story or their own lives. Like I think self-knowledge is like incomplete and in flux and always obstructed by things we can't quite understand, which is part of what makes it exciting too. Like we don't fully know ourselves. We're still like learning ourselves and discovering ourselves and remembering you know, the CSA or the 12 times going to the matrix or, you know, um, but that sense of kind of, as I'm exploring certain dimensions of what it feels like to be alive or asking certain questions, like my own life is one set of materials that I have at my disposal and it's one set of materials that I have a particularly like acute kind of access to. And so I think it, it, it's, it's almost like that's where I feel like I can do some of the best writing from. Um, but it's interesting, you know, the, the other part of your question about turning from fiction to nonfiction, I think that, yeah, there was, I think I was really just following a kind of aesthetic feeling that the writing was exciting to me when I let myself um, let go of some of what started to feel like a kind of apparatus about fiction to me, not to say that fiction is more constructed or more artificial or anything like that, but just that for me, there was something really energizing about turning from 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 fiction and particularly from the form of the novel to the form of the essay, which had something to do with the ways in which I had just been thinking about writing fiction for so long that I felt like I had all these voices perched on my shoulder and all of these implicit or explicit instructions or commandments about how to write it. And I just didn't know as much about essays and nobody had ever told me how to write an essay. And so it felt wilder and freer and, and it wasn't the thing I was supposed to be doing. It felt like this um, 
sometimes I described it as like a mistress project or something. It was like this kind of thing on the side and that was exciting. Um, but I think it was also this sense that I could like, you know, kind of really what we were talking about earlier about bringing, you know, bringing like the personal self and the critical self and the reporter self that all of those selves could be together and that I was allowed to really, really just think on the page explicitly. Like there, there was something about it that just felt very, very free, um, which is a strange thing to think about moving from the made up world to the actual world that it feels more freeing, but it really, it really did. And it was more about getting to occupy those, those multiple perspectives at once, which is very possible in fiction as well. It's just the way I needed to come to it was somehow through the form of the essay. Hi, um, I'd like to ask about your process of writing and revising the recovering, if that's okay, because if I'm getting this right, you um, wrote your PhD dissertation on um, a work that became the recovering, and I was curious um, what it was like to write for the purpose of a dissertation versus writing for a general reader with the recovering as a book, not for school, but for a general reader, right? And what you took out of your dissertation for the recovering or what you added for the recovering, and I guess like what that process was like, what was challenging or what was maybe easier about it because you already had the form of the dissertation and you know, if you could talk about that revision process. Yeah, so you're you're absolutely right that um, a lot of the research that ended up becoming part of the recovering, which is um, which is among other things, a book about how both addiction and recovery shape the creative process. And I was thinking about those questions in the context of my own life, but also looking at all of these other writers and artists, everybody from, yeah, John Berryman to Billie Holiday, um, people who got sober, tried to get sober, never got sober, how their creative practices were sort of shaped by those various states. And um, I did do a lot of research for a doctoral dissertation, um, but it was like, there was zero writing that was in common between the dissertation and the the book itself, um, but the dissertation was like a really useful structure around doing a lot of, especially a lot of that like archival research. Um, at a certain point, I knew pretty early on in the writing of the dissertation, I knew that that wasn't the final form I wanted that material to take, that I really wanted to write a book that was gonna be honest about the personal experience that was like taking me to those archives and the personal experience that was like animating my research in those archives, which was really like trying to think through not only how to stay sober, but like what it might be like to try to be creative in sobriety. Um, and that, that those like deeply felt questions, which for, for me were also like questions I was living out as I was like driving endlessly through cornfields, like feeling like I was going out of my mind in early sobriety, like that there was this really palpable, visceral dimension to those questions that I was like, that was very much with me in those archives and the book I was most excited about writing was gonna like let the personal nature of that question be at the core. Um, but at a certain point in the process, I went to the Museum of Natural History in New York and saw this frog, this particular, I promise this is related, this um, kind of Amazonian tree frog that does this crazy thing. The male frogs um, will like hook up with a female frog and they have this like little clutch of eggs um, that that is like in a kind of like a crook of the tree trunk that is like the eggs that they're fertilizing and are gonna raise together. But that the male frog will sometimes go out and almost like deceive other female frogs and say, oh, I'm gonna like fertilize your eggs too, but he'll actually take those second crop of eggs and use them to feed the first crop of eggs. That's like his real crop of eggs. And when I saw that tree frog, I realized that I had found this like kind of metaphor for how I was thinking about my dissertation, which was that I always <laughs> knew that like the, 
the the that dissertation was just that it was just nourishment for this like ultimate hybrid project that I wanted to create, and it actually really freed me up uh, in the writing of it because once you start to think of something as just a provisional document, it, it it's a lot easier it's a lot easier to write it. So um, and the, the you know all the things you're asking about like the language of the dissertation is totally different than the language of the book, um, and the language of the book is ultimately the language that I that feels like my own voice and that I felt much more invested in. Um, but I think I felt forever grateful to the structure of the dissertation as just a way to engage in that research and um, to kind of follow those questions, um, to follow those questions into the archives in the first place. We have time for one final question. After that, feel free to join us in the lobby for a book signing. I have a mic for you. Um, well, thank you, I, uh, both of you, for speaking. I think uh, it's been really enlightening to hear uh, you speak about your work and your process. And I just, um, my question, I think that my friend Laura here, we were just chatting about it a little bit earlier, but um, it's about structure and just uh, your your process uh, when you go to the page. So if it's, um, like I recently read Fog Count, which I really enjoyed, uh, that for that piece, for example, was it something where you had um, gone on this trip and then had, had done sort of the research you needed to do and then did you sort of have an, an outline in mind for when you would start to be doing the writing and do you have, when you do start a piece, do you have um, a little bit of a, do you have an exit strategy in mind or, um, does that more often come when you after you start and are halfway through it? Yeah, that's a great way to. Is, do you <laughs> an exit strategy in mind? That's amazing. Is that a way of asking? Is that is the exit strategy mean like an ending in mind? Yeah. 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 I, I love that phrase too. Yeah. Um. So f so fog count. Assuming many people in the room haven't have not read it. Um. No shame. Uh, is uh, is an essay about um an ultra runner named Charlie Engel who. Ended up in prison for um, mortgage fraud, and I was I had I had previously written about the ultra marathon community and was really interested in what it meant for this man who was always in motion to be uh, locked in one place, and and his story is a way of thinking about one of the kind of core violences of incarceration as just physically keeping somebody in one place. So it started, and this really gets to your question about structure and maybe in the case of that piece, the relationship between structure and surprise. It started as a prof, I imagined it as a profile of Charlie, and you know, he had this really interesting life story. He had been a, um, a, a crack addict and, a, and a, um, a father and had gotten sober and, you know, as was the case for actually a number of ultramarathoners, had this like really intense ultramarathoning life that sort of rose up out of his sobriety. But then he had this sort of like, there was a kind of triumphant arc to his like crack addict, got sober, became this amazing ultra runner that then really got like pivoted in this other direction when he was in incarcerated. And uh, so I, I thought that it was a piece about Charlie and we corresponded for many months and we talked on the phone and you know I, I was getting this deeper and deeper sense of him and what he was all about and what incarceration had been like for him. Um, and then I went to visit him and he was from North Carolina but was incarcerated in West Virginia. And um, when I went, I drove out to see him and when I drove through West Virginia um, and spent some time I was staying with a friend there who was deeply involved in the grassroots land reform movement and a lot of the mining protests that were happening there. And she was also, she's a pretty amazing person, but she was also involved in founding this thing called the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum that was like this collection of oral histories around labor, lab, labor movements in that region. And I started to think a lot, it was like, I had never imagined that the essay was gonna be about West Virginia at all. It was a piece about Charlie who happened to be incarcerated in West Virginia. But when I went there and drove through that landscape and started to think about the relationship between this like utterly beautiful landscape I was seeing from the highway and what I knew about the ways that mining had devastated that landscape and being in conversation with all these people from West Virginia, 
um, who had really dedicated their lives to uh, the, the, the land and the history of like really violent histories of labor on the land, I, I started to feel like, oh, the edges of this essay are different than what I thought they were. And it was maybe another version of the floor dropping out and realizing that I was in a bigger room than I thought I was standing in. Um, and so then the, the piece was still about Charlie, but it was also about West Virginia. And I was trying to think about the relationships between the industry of, of, of mining and the industry of incarceration and, and what they were both doing to this landscape. Um, and so in that sense, I there was part of the experience of reporting the piece that changed my sense of what the piece could hold or should hold or what the most exciting version of the piece would hold. Um, and you know, I, I structurally, I think I wanted to find a lot of the moments in the story of my coming to know Charlie that felt like they connected some of those threads that I decided would be exciting to bring into the piece. And um, when, when Charlie talked about, one of the things he talked about, we spent like eight hours together when I went to visit him in prison, and, and one of the things he talked about was this fog count, which was a, you know, a, um, a making sure that all of the, the, the men were present and accounted for. Um, and there was something about that moment of hearing him talk about the counting and accounting of those bodies. And then an hour after he told me that, like my body got to leave the prison and his body had to stay. Um, and when you talk about exit strategies, I think in that moment I knew that like part of where this piece was gonna land wasn't just with Charlie, but was about this confession of the fact that like I could go in there and write about what this experience was like for him, and at the end of the day, um, I was gonna get to go, and he was gonna have to stay. Um, so I think often some at least intuitive sense of the exit strategy in that case like literally related to an exit capacity or an exit strategy often like suggests itself at some point in the process where I feel like oh right this turn or like this like brutal pivot is kind of where somehow where this piece needs to land. All right. I want to keep going but I think that we're done. Thank you so Thanks much for your Megan. time today. Thank you. <laughs>